No writer who knows the great writers who did not receive the prize can accept it other than with humility. There is no need to list these writers. Everyone here may make his own list according to his knowledge and his conscience. It would be impossible for me to ask the ambassador of my country to read a speech in which a writer said all of the things which are in his heart. Things may not be immediately discernible in what a man writes, and in this sometimes he is fortunate, but eventually they are quite clear, and by these and the degree of alchemy that he possesses, he will endure or be forgotten. Writing at its best is a lonely life. Organizations for writers palliate the writer's loneliness, but I doubt if they improve his writing. He grows in public stature as he sheds his loneliness, and often his work deteriorates. For he does his work alone, and if he is a good enough writer, he must face eternity, or the lack of it, each day. For a true writer, each book should be a new beginning where he tries again for something that is beyond attainment. He should always try for something that has never been done or that others have tried and failed. Then sometimes, with good luck, he will succeed. How simple the writing of literature would be if it were only necessary to write in another way what has been well written. It is because we have had such great writers in the past that a writer is driven far out past where he can go, out to where no one can help him. I have spoken too long for a writer. A writer should write what he has to say and not speak it. Again, I thank you. Now sleeps he with that old whore death who yesterday denied her thrice. Repeat after me. Now sleeps he with that old whore death who yesterday denied her thrice. Pause. Wait for them to close up. Continue. Did you deny her? Yes. Thrice? Yes. Repeat after me. Do you take this old whore death for thy lawful wedded wife? Repeat after me. I do, I do, I do. KIA 60FF61EM 13th September 2400, 14th September 2400. Translate. Killed in action, six officers, 61 enlisted men, from midnight 13th September to midnight 14th September. Repeat after me 67 times. I do, I do, I do. 67 times. Continue. This continue. In the next war, we shall bury the dead in cellophane. In the next war, we shall bury the dead in cellophane. The host shall come packaged in every K ration. The host shall come packaged in every K ration. Every man shall be provided with a small but perfect Archbishop Spellman, which shall be self-inflatable, courtesy of air reduction, open, closed, previous, open, closed. You don't need to repeat this. There is not any ceremony anymore. Everyone is gone, and you say this out loud to yourself. You are alone at the time, and the time now is always. Always was a word you used in promises. It is valueless. All officers, warrant officers, and enlisted men will be provided with a copy of their own true loves that they will never see again and all these copies will be returnable through the proper channels. My own true love is Mary Welsh. Then, of course, she will be returnable. But I, on this day, will not accept the signature 
of Archbishop Spellman, nor of you, nor of you, nor of you. You may all go now, all of you. Go as quietly as possible. Go as far as possible. You may even take possible with you, if you can find him, and you may hang him or dispose of him in any manner that you see fit. Today, no one uses slang because clarity is of the utmost importance. Fucking alone is retained, but it is used only as an adjective. Sweating out is retained. It means that which one must suffer without any possibility of changing the result or the outcome. Those of us who know walk very slowly and we look at one another with infinite love and compassion. This comes only after 100 days and is one of the final symptoms. There has been irritation, anger, fear, doubt, accusations, denials, misinterpretations, mistakes, cowardice, inability, and lack of talent for this work. All this has been and will be again to be counterbalanced by firmness, steadiness, courage, quick understanding, and the ability both to maneuver and to fight. But now, for a moment, there's only love and compassion. Know how to endure, and only love and compassion. Repeat it. Only love and compassion. For the FBs too, battle fatigues, officers, men, midnight, 13 sep. We don't give any numbers, midnight, 14 sep, no. Then it is not compassion. Not for the battle fatigues, too. And yes, it is love and compassion. How can you say that here? How can you say the other? Not that we ask for more. Not that we wish ever any. Not that we wish any all. Not that we want any greater. But when they walked away from that undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns who hasn't been there, they walked away from this we cannot state. And in them died this inner knowing that grows, fresher and lovelier than any rose, manured by death and watered only with unshed tears. Until this day, it flowers into this love and this compassion. Not for them, no, I am sorry. Then it is not complete, no, nor will it be ever. There is no contrition. No bloody fucking contrition. Only love and compassion. Reach out your hand to love's dark sister hate and walk with her across that hill we slowly walk and see if love is waiting at the top or who is waiting there instead. Did I tell you my heart is a target of opportunity? Love's lovely sister, lovingly unloving, unworryingly succeeding, procuring unprocuringly, never wholly wrong nor more than half right, holding unholingly the hold where love leaves easily without address. Love lightly leaves without a trace, and her dark sister fills in all the forms. All, all the forms so neatly filled, the writing clear and good, where love's is often quite illegible. Scrawled lightly in a hurry as she smiled, giving unimportance to the page. Do you think there upon the hill we'll find her there? No. She's long gone. She never stands to fight. Knowing too well the idiocy of battle, love's always gone, leaving us only the deserted sacrament that one finds dinner on the table in the house of a new taken village. So that we wear it now. Traces of it are worn on our chins, 
like remnants of the yolk of the rare and much desired egg, our scooped up newly eaten sacrament, bringing it with our newly issued pictures of our true loves up toward the high ground beyond the town, toward the easy dirt mouth smile we had denied so many days, D plus 108. Now all move slowly plodding up that hill, making feet slowly go where they know better than to take you. Feet are wise and feet are wary, feet of John and feet of Harry. Feet know better, feet won't go. Make feet move on slowly now, make feet follow where no plow leads you ahead, where things are sown toward the place where you'll be dead. Returner now through the prescribed channels. Returner. This will aid you. Song to aid you to return. What they will do to others, they will do to you. If you never suffer, God will see you through. Onward Christian soldiers marching to a whore with the cross of Mary Welsh going on before. Throw your love away. You must do it slowly now, slowly now and pray. Pray to all of nothing, pray to all of nil. Throw away your own true love walking up a hill. Repeat it now again. Now sleeps he with that old whore death who yesterday denied her thrice. If you know, if you conceive, if you too, if, 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 not the poem that was given you framed for Christmas in Oak Park, Illinois, written by Rudyard Kipling, but the other if, older than the if of Hamlet, the old, long, ugly if that we have faced in all the nights and all the forests of our hearts, always coming out into a clearing, always sighting finally the smoke of the campfire. Now, on this wooded hill again, if, ifingly to proceed, if me no ifs, my true love, while we expend that which is not expendable, while we destroy that which is indestructible, with nothing more than harassing fire. Nothing more than that. All my heart is a target of opportunity. All of us have been interdicted. This is not the way it was. I have not been there. No one was there. No one saw it. Your guess is as good as mine. Make a guess now while it is easy. Get your guess in early. Try and get your guess in for tonight. Especially for tonight. Tonight, we... And there are only 89 days more until Christmas. Put in Christmas. All of us will die today. Hail to Father Christmas. Old and young together say, Hail to Father Christmas. Bright the colored flax pit shine. Hail to Father Christmas. Bright today our love divine. Hail to Father Christmas. D plus 10109. Hail to Father Christmas. Christmas minus 99. Hail to Father Christmas. Come, let's put it on the line. Hail to Father Christmas. No longer Christmas. And from this hill, air topped, its flanks covered with Christmas trees, many further hills are seen. So, Mary, now I love you straight and true, and send you this to let you know that we had a rather sticky day today in the forest. Casualties were fairly heavy, and a certain amount of battle fatigues, many more than there should be, but there are many contributing factors. I'm getting sort of mixed up on a lot of things again, but much clearer on others. Very hard to write about this stuff. It is different from the book. In the boat, we were always waiting for it. Here it is the happening all the time, and who it happens to. I do not think about me at all anymore, bragging again. I think about you, and that brings me in. I write you awfully dull letters, darling, because I get tired and sort of emptied out. And all I have to tell you that I can write is that I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, 
It is a great honor to be with you tonight and to discuss my new book. This is one of the things that I love to do most, and it gives me great pleasure that I sh can share it with all of you. The book came to me in a sort of a haze in Harry's Bar in Venice. Harry's Bar is a small place, but it is, in effect, a microcosm of all of that great and beautiful city which has been so well described by those writers Ruskin, Sinclair Lewis, Byron, and others. The hero, if he can be called a hero of this book, is a young colonel, 18 years old. He was made a colonel, no one knows quite how, and stationed in Trieste for his own sins. He is a fanatic at shooting at all things, including objects floating down the Grand Canal, and he has come to Venice to practice his shall we say, avocation. In Venice, in Harry's Bar, which has become almost a sacred place to those of us who know it and who have enjoyed both the credit and the hospitality of Cipriani, he meets an Italian, or rather, should we say, a Venetian countess, aged 86. In the corner of the room is a princess of Greece named Aspasia. The young colonel is mad about the princess of Greece, but still he has his countess and his obligations. The action of the book, ladies and gentlemen, only takes place during a period of 48 days, during which the colonel, who is continuously in Harry's bar, known to the local residents or indigentes as Ciprianis, is continuously drunk due to his own efforts and his credit with Signor, speaking Italian, Cipriani. For 40 of these 48 days, the Colonel is unable to find his Countess. She has taken refuge in the Basilica. Naturally, she is given full facilities there and enjoys herself very much, looking out of the upper windows and studying the action of the pigeons. During this time of indecision for the young colonel, who is on indefinite leave, by the request of his superior officers, he makes the acquaintance of a beautiful Venetian maiden, aged no one knows what. Some say 16, some say 17, others who are treacherous say 18. She, through her powers of seductiveness, induces him to visit the island of Tornicello. The colonel is accompanied by his faithful black priest, who is his spiritual advisor and can almost be regarded as his spiritual manager. Together, they make a pilgrimage to this island, a very ancient part of the lagoon which surrounds Venice, a town which I shall describe later after consulting my Baedeker. It is love at first sight between the Colonel and Aftera. There is nothing to be done. It is a hopeless love, 
but much can come of it. And the Colonel takes advantage of this situation in a manner which might be criticized in certain circles, but which we will attempt to condone due to the presence of his faithful black priest, who at this moment has passed out. Aftera, or oh, Aftera, as the name is pronounced by the local inhabitants, is indomitable. Nothing like her has been seen since Attila the Hun sat in the sacred chair of Tornicello. The colonel, who is an extremely devout Catholic, having only been expelled from the church at the age of 16, loves Aftara as he has never loved anyone in all of his existence. Aftara loves him as she loves the front page of Europeo. What greater comparison can we make? God himself is absent for a time, probably on his own business, but he returns to Tornicello to bring happiness to these star-crossed lovers. Aftera and the Colonel marry. But, ladies and gentlemen, there is tragedy in all of this. There is a tragedy that one can hardly say without having his voice break. Aftera is the victim of a heart condition, a cardiac condition acquired during her youth. The colonel cannot stand to see her die, and so he himself swims off into the sunset, headed as far as we know toward Georgia, a fishing port. well down the coast, but the colonel can swim, and we hope that he can make it. This, in a quick resume, is the story of my new book, and I hope that everyone will buy it, paying three dollars, and the 20 percent of each of these three dollars will go to me, to pay Gallaretta and other people first, and then to go to the Fondacion Aftera, which is to commemorate that great soul who has brought us such happiness. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience. This is Ernest Hemingway. The fifth column was written in the fall and early winter of 1937 while we were expecting an offensive. There were three major offensive projects for the Army of the Center that year. One of them was Brunetti. It had been fought, had started brilliantly, and ended in a very bloody and undecisive battle. And we were waiting for the first of the other two. They never came. But while we waited, I wrote the play. Each day we were shelled by the guns beyond Leganes and behind the folds of Garabitas Hill. And while I was writing the play, the Hotel Florida, where we lived and worked, was struck by more than 30 high explosive shells. So if it is not a good play, perhaps that is what is the matter with it. If it is a good play, Perhaps those 30-some shells helped write it. When you went to the front, at its closest it was 1,500 yards from the hotel, the play was always slipped inside the inner fold of a rolled-up mattress. 
When you came back and found the room and the play intact, you were always pleased. It was finished and copied and sent out of the country just before the taking of Teruel. The title refers to the Spanish statement in the fall of 1936 that they had four columns advancing on Madrid and a fifth column of sympathizers inside the city to attack the defenders of the city from the rear. If many of the fifth column are now dead, it must be realized that they were killed in a warfare where they were as dangerous and as determined as any of those who died in the other four columns. Four columns advancing on Madrid shot their prisoners. When members of the fifth column were captured inside the city in the early days of the war, they were also shot. Later, they were to be tried and given prison or labor camp sentences or sentenced to execution, depending upon the crimes they had committed against the Republic. But in the early days, they were shot. They deserved to be under the rules of war, and they expected to be. Some fanatical defenders of the Spanish Republic, and fanatics do not make good friends for a cause, will criticize the play because it admits that fifth column members were shot. They will also say, and have said, that it does not present the nobility and dignity of the cause of the Spanish people. It does not attempt to. It will take many plays and novels to do that, and the best ones will be written after the war is over. This is only a play about counter-espionage in Madrid. It has the defects of having been written in wartime, and if it has a moral, it is that people who work for certain organizations have very little time for home life. There is a girl in it named Dorothy, but her name might also have been Nostalgia. Perhaps it would be best now for you to see it and for me to stop talking about it. But if being written under fire makes for defects, it may also give a certain vitality. You who see it will have a better perspective on this than I have. About the stories, there is not much to say. The first four are the last ones I have written. The others follow in the order in which they were originally published. The first one I wrote was up in Michigan, written in Paris in 1921. The last was Old Man at the Bridge, cabled from Barcelona in April of 1938. Beside the fifth column, I wrote The Killers, Today is Friday, Ten Indians, Part of the Sun Also Rises, and the first third of To Have and Have Not in Madrid. It was always a good place for working. So was Paris, and so were Key West, Florida in the cool months, the ranch near Cook City, Montana, Kansas City, Chicago, Toronto, and Havana, Cuba. Some other places were not so good, but maybe we were not so good when we were in them. There was a long white beach with coconut palms behind it. The reef lay across the entrance of the harbor, and the heavy east wind made the sea break on it so that the entrance was easy to see once you had opened it up. There was no one on the beach, and the sand was so white that it hurt your eyes to look at it. The man on the flying bridge studied the shore. There were no shacks where the shacks should have been, and there were no boats anchored in the lagoon that he could see. You've been in here before, he said to his mate. Yes. Weren't the shacks over there? They were over there, and it shows a village on a chart. They sure as hell aren't there now, the man said. Can you make out any boats up in the mangroves? There's nothing that I can see. I'm going to take her in and anchor, the man said. I know this cut. It's about eight times as deep as it looks. He looked down into the green water and saw the size of the shadow of his ship on the bottom. There's good holding ground east from where the village used to be, his mate said. I know. Break out the starboard anchor and stand by. I'm going to lay off there. 
With this wind blowing day and night, there will be no insects. No, sir. They anchored in the boat. She was not big enough to be called a ship, except in the mind of the man who was her master. Lay with her bow into the wind with the waves breaking white and green on the reef. The man on the bridge watched that she swung well and held solidly. Then he looked ashore and cut his motors. He continued to look at the shore, and he could not figure it out at all. Take three men in and have a look, he said. I'm going to lie down a while. Remember your scientists. When they were scientists, no weapons showed, and they wore machetes and wide straw hats, such as Bahaman spongers wear. These the crew referred to as sombrero scientificos. The larger they were, the more scientific they were considered. Someone has stolen my scientific hat, a heavy-shouldered basque thick eyebrows that came together over his nose said, give me a bag of frags for science sake. Take my scientific hat. Another back said, it's twice as scientific as yours. What a scientific hat, the widest of the back said. I feel like Einstein in this one. Tomas, can we take specimens? No, the man said. George knows what I want him to do. You keep your damn scientific eyes open. I'll look for water. It's behind where the village was. The man said, see how it is. We had probably better fill. H2O, Bath said. That's scientific stuff. Hey, you worthless scientist, you hat stealer. Give us four or five gallon jugs so we won't waste a trip. The other Bath put four wicker covered jugs in the dinghy. The man heard them talking. Don't hit me in the back with that damn scientific ore. I only do it for science. Fornicate science and his brother. Science's sister. Penicillina is her name. The man watched them rowing toward the two white beach. I should have gone in, he thought. But I was up all night and I've steered 12 hours. George can size it up as well as I can. But I wonder what the hell has happened. He looked once at the reef and then at the shore the current of the clean water running against the side and making little eddies in the, in the lead. Then he shut his eyes and turned on his side and went to sleep. He woke as the dinghy came alongside and he knew it was something bad when he saw their faces. His mate was sweating as he always did with trouble or bad news. He was a dry man and did not sweat easily. Somebody burned the shacks, he said. Somebody tried to put them out there are bodies in the ashes. You can't smell them from here because of the wind. How many bodies? We counted nine. There could be more. Men or women? Both. Are there any tracks? Nothing. It's rained since. Heavy rain. The sand is still pitted with it. The wide-shouldered Basque, whose name was Aaron, said, they've been dead a week anyway. Birds haven't worked on them, but the land crabs are working on them. How do you know they've been dead a week? No one can say exactly, Ara said, but they've been dead about a week. From the land crab trails, the rain was about three days ago. How was the water? It looked all right. Did you bring it? Yes. I don't see why they should have poisoned the water, Ara said. It smelled good, so I tasted it and brought it. You shouldn't have tasted it. It smelled good and there was no reason to believe it was poison. Who killed the people? Anybody. Didn't you check? No. We came to tell you. You were the skipper. All right, said Thomas Hudson. He went below and buckled on his revolver. There was a sheath knife on the other side of the belt, the side that rode high, and there was the weight of the gun on his leg below his shorts. He stopped in the galley and found a spoon and put it in his pocket. Ara, you and Henry come ashore. Willie, come in with a dinghy and then see if you can get some conks. Let Peter sleep. To his mate, he said, check the engines, please, and all tanks. The water was clear and lovely over the white sand bottom, and he could see every ridge and wrinkle in the sand as they waded ashore when the dinghy 
grounded on a ridge. He felt small fish playing around his toes and saw they were tiny pompano. Maybe they're not true pompano, he thought, but they're exactly like them. They're most friendly. Henry, he said when they were ashore, you take the windward beach and walk it all the way up to the mangroves. Watch for tracks or anything else. Meet me here. Ara, you take the other beach and do the same. He did not have to ask where the bodies were. He saw the tracks that led to them and heard the rattle of the land crabs in the dry brush. He looked out at his ship in the line of breakers and Lily in the stern of the skiff with a water glass, looking over the side for conks as the skiff drifted. Since I have to do it, I might as well get it over, he thought. But this day was built for something else. It is strange how they have such a rain here, and there was no need for it, and we had nothing. How long is it now that we have seen the rains go by on either side and never had a drop? The wind was blowing heavily, and had blown now, day and night, for more than 50 days. It had become a part of the man, and it did not make him nervous. It fortified him and gave him strength, and he hoped that it would never stop. We wait always for something that does not come, he thought. But it is easier waiting with the wind than in a calm or with the capriciousness and the malignancy of squalls. There is always water somewhere. Let it stay dry. We can always find it. There is water on all these keys if you know how to look for it. Now, he thought to himself, go in and get it over. When I was a young boy, it was not necessary to pay any money to women. Later, I paid money to a few women to whom I wished all good things well. The principal woman of these was one named Alice, who weighed approximately 258 pounds. Her fee for love was two dollars, but she did not collect this fee if love was made satisfactory, and she often loaned me money to get a can of beans or something else in order that I might fight or box or attempt to box or attempt to fight in northern Michigan. She was a very beautiful girl, in spite of her weight, and I love her dearly still. I never had the good fortune to know Miss Matahari. Since at the time that she was such important, I was a simple lieutenant, and she was consorting with general officers and cabinet ministers. However, one night, I fucked her very well. Although I found her to be rather heavy around the hip, and to have more desire for what was done to her than what she was giving to the man gave her. After the war, I worked in three whorehouses, which were located in Billings, Montana, Red Lodge, Montana, and Cody, Wyoming. I was young at the time and trying to write, and it was difficult to preserve the balance between trying to write and working in a whorehouse where every Saturday night you broke your hand. In Billings, Montana, I broke my hand every Saturday night due to the influx of local citizenry who lived in the outskirts and came in to have fun and at the end of it wished to fight and I was forced to fight with them and take them outside. This is not a profitable trade. After my hands were broken and I did not think that I could continue in building it writing, I moved to Red Lodge, where we only had to throw people out of the whorehouse on Saturday night, because 
because they were mostly thin and were usually armed with knives. Although they were very good people, and I liked them very much. In Red Lodge, where I had to fight only on Saturday night, my hands cured quite well and became strong again, or as strong as they could be in a small way. And I then proceeded to Cody, where I had been offered a profitable position, uh, much as my friend, uh, the millionario, uh, Roberto Herrera y Sotolongo <laughs> offered. The hands were still broken when I left the Red Lodge, but by taping them, I could get by and Cody, which is not a very difficult town to bounce in because the people who come there are well known and you know their faults and can hit them and you win. In Cody, I was quite successful and met many interesting whores, professional whores, and since I did not believe that there were any good girls, and I cared nothing about the idea of them, since I had already abandoned any hope or fear of them. In Cody, we had many interesting fights for those who watched them but they were not of anything to be broadcasted, nor television, nor put on any form of radio activity. In Cuba, an island where I live, though I am not a citizen thereof, I do not subscribe to politics, I have known and for various We will mention None of their names. As regards amateur wars, I have known a vast group of them. They are much duller than the professional wars because they are not truly conscious of their metier. Metier is a French phrase which means Spanish, oficio, and in American means their trade. I could describe these women for a long time, and it would probably or possibly interest you, my radio audience, but I do not propose to describe them nor to say anything about them until a previous broadcast, which we will hold at another date. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Don Andre, uh, Mr. Zinsky, uh, Roberto, Gianfranco, Miss Mary, que está desparatido, y todo el mundo. Muchas gracias.